we're going to get started. Um, uh, there are four handouts um, for tonight, and again, the backgrounds on the slides will change depending on the handout we're in. We are going to be going through um, and continuing our conversation on um, the law, uh, the section of scripture known as the law, um, and uh, tonight we're going to kind of focus on four different aspects of that, including kind of the application of that. How do we apply, how do we use the law? Um, we talked a little bit last time about how the law is not actually for us. Um, as New Testament believers, we're not under that covenant, so the law does not directly apply to us. However, it does have some indirect um, application for us, so we'll talk about that a little bit more tonight. Uh, so let's pray, we're going to just dive into this, because we've got a lot to get through. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your truth revealed in your word and throughout history. Lord, we ask that you would meet us in the truth of your word and show us how to um, understand it and apply it to our lives. Um, and help us to, to kind of wade through the complexity of some of these issues of what parts of scripture are directly applicable to us and which ones are not. Um, help us to understand that fully. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. And I'll just say this up front. The, the law is very unique in Scripture in that of all the aspects of Scripture, I mean, we can read the Old Testament, the historical aspects of the Old Testament, and say, oh, right, we don't think that applies to us. We just understand that's history, right? Um, whereas the law has so many commands in it, we would be like, okay, what do I do with this command? And the answer is, well, we have to kind of sift through that to determine, um, I, I would say generally speaking, and we'll talk about this more in depth later, but generally speaking, there's kind of a sense of like, the answer is we don't have to do anything with it, have to, but there's things we can do with the law. Um, and so it is a little unique. So the first topic tonight is going to be about the law in Israel and its place in Scripture. So in other words, what was the focus and the purpose of the law for the people of Israel? So even though Christians are not required to keep the Old Testament law, it still has value to us. In fact, I would go beyond saying not required to. We can, cannot and should not keep the Old Testament law, um, at least not every aspect of it. Um, we, can, we, we should not keep any of the sacrificial law, for instance. Anything that talks about, like, this is what you do when you have this kind of sin, you sacrifice this kind of animal. We, we should not, as Christians, be doing that. Because Jesus is that ultimate sacrifice. To go back to that, the author of Hebrews would be, to, uh, would be basically saying Jesus' sacrifice wasn't enough. So that's not something we should not be doing for sure. Um, but we're not required to keep it, so what do we do with it? It still has value to us. Um, in function, uh, it functioned in the history of salvation to lead us to Christ. And in Galatians 3.24, um, sorry, I got new glasses this week. I'm still getting used to them. They're bifocals and they're messing me up. Um, uh, it, it functioned in the history of salvation to lead us to Christ. So in Galatians 3.24, Paul uses this um, analogy when it comes to the law. He says, it was like a pedagogue uh, that led us to Jesus. And um, we use the word pedagogue to mean like a teacher, though in, in ancient uh, Hellenistic culture, the culture that Paul was writing into, pedagogues were actually family servants whose main role was to take a child and bring them from the, the home to their teacher or on occasion meet, maybe tutor them, but they weren't actually even the primary teacher. That wasn't their role. So... Um, the idea is that, the, to put it another way, is the law points us to who God is, who Jesus is, and our great need for him. Um, and that is one of its functions, big picture. But it also helps us to understand what it means for Israel to be God's people. How did Israel function as God's people? The law is a big part of that. Um, their, their obedience to the law allowed them to reflect the, the characteristics of God to a, an unbelieving world around them and the, their ability or, or lack thereof to follow the law, to be obedient to it, would determine how well they represented Yahweh, the Lord, to their neighbors. Um, 
However, nowhere in the Old Testament does it say, suggest that anyone was saved by keeping the law. And what we mean by saved here is that they would, that their sins were fully forgiven and that they, they had a, uh, a, right, a fully right relationship with God. Um, salvation is not found in the law. The Old Testament doesn't even claim that it does. There is a text in Deuteronomy that says explicitly, our righteousness will be tied to our obedience to the law. And the, the word righteous in Scripture means right standing. So their right standing with God would be tied to their obedience to the law. That's what, that's what Moses says in Deuteronomy about it. The problem with that, of course, is they never kept the law fully, and therefore their right standing with God would have always been in jeopardy, which is actually the failure of the Old Covenant um, that, that is brought up in the prophets and then, and then, in a sense, made right with the New Covenant. It was the failure of the people. So when people failed to keep the law perfectly, God provided them means of forgiveness and atonement. What was the, the means of forgiveness and atonement in the Old Testament? Animal sacrifice. That they had to constantly do. They had to constantly sacrifice animals, like at least multiple times a year, but like most devout Jews would do it weekly at least. Uh, if you lived near the, the tabernacle or the temple, you would probably be offering sacrifices on a weekly basis for the sins that you committed throughout the week. And think about the tally of sins that you would have to be keeping track of to say, uh, okay, I lied, what category of sin does this fall under? What kind of, do I need a guilt offering here? Do I need a, you know, and there's, and there's different, and if you read the Old Testament law, it's not like, oh, a lie, you sacrifice a pigeon. You know, it's not like that. It doesn't work that way. It was, if you, if you committed a sin that was intentional, there was a certain kind of sacrifice. It was an unintentional sin. It was a different kind of sacrifice. If it was a sin that, of omission, like you didn't do, there was, there was different types of sacrifices depending on what you, what you did. Um, and then there was other offerings that you could give besides that. Israel's problem in the Old Testament was not in their inability to keep the law, though they were unable to keep it. That's not what God keeps pointing out to them, though. Throughout the, the Old Testament, especially in the prophets, what God keeps pointing out isn't, hey, you can't keep this on your own. He's saying, you have no desire to keep it. The issue here is not just that you're broken and can't keep the law, it's that you're disobedient and you choose not to keep it. So that was the issue. It was an issue of disobedience. It was their choosing not to do so, which was an issue of disobedience. So that is the thing that God keeps pointing out through the prophets when we talk about the prophets later. Overwhelmingly, the prophets, how we understand the prophets, is tied to the law. And God kind of claim against the Israelites aren't like, hey, I know you're trying your best, but you're failing. I know, because you can't really do this. It was, you guys aren't even trying. You don't want to be obedient. You want to be disobedient. And so that was his claim against them. You're not trying to keep the law. And like, obviously, people, some people did, but as a people, as a whole, there was a sense of disobedience overwhelmingly that God would keep pointing out to them. The story of Israel in the Old Testament is a record of constant flirtation and attraction to the false gods of their neighbors. The Israelites constantly were either flat out just worshiping other gods or at least kind of dabbling in, in, in the worship of, the, of other gods. Um, in, in Isaiah, uh, the prophet Isaiah has this vision in Isaiah chapter 6 where he stands before the throne of God. Um, and, and he, the first thing that Isaiah says is he goes, Woe unto me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and I've seen the Lord. And after God purifies his lips because he admits they're unclean, God says, I'm going to send you as a prophet, and this is what you're to tell the people. He said, Go and tell the pe this people, you are ever hearing but never understanding. You are ever seeing but never perceiving. He says, make the hearts of this people calloused, make their ears dull and close their eyes, otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. What is going on here is Israel is being described as dumb, deaf, uh, blind, deaf, and dumb, 
like the idols they worshipped. And I just read Isaiah 6, 9 through 10. They're, they're, the more that they mimic and worship these idols, the more they begin to look like them. Likewise, the more that they actually worship and obey the Lord, the more they look like him, which is the whole point. That that's what they're supposed to do. That was the purpose of the law. So instead of reflecting Yahweh's justice, mercy, and, and love, they wind up reflecting these idols they chase after. They begin looking like the Baals of the Canaanites. Um, Baal is a, is a kind of a borrowed word, if you want to get technical, um, but it is a word that translates loosely as master, um, and it's, it's, uh, it's the name that is given to a variety of Canaanite deities um, or regional deities of, of the ancient Near East. Um, sometimes you'll hear about, if, you, if, you ever, if you're ever weird and read up on this stuff, you'll hear about Baal as a god. And that is true. There was a, there was a god named, a false god named Baal, but then he, the idea is that they'd be like, oh, this is the Baal of Asheron. This is the Baal of you know, this region or that region. And the idea was... They didn't have a real tight theology, but sometimes it was described like there's one god named Baal, but he kind of manifests himself in different ways, very similar to Hinduism, actually. But the Baals of the Canaanites, all of the gods of Canaan, um, which was the region that Israel, the Israelites came and settled in, their gods, you hear the stories, read the stories of their gods, and their gods are greedy, they're fickle, and they're sexually immoral. And that's exactly what happens to Israel as they start following after them. One of the, the very clear examples of this is if you look at the northern kingdom, when there is a divided kingdom in Israel's history, um, we, use, uh, we use this queen's name as a byword now, the word Jezebel. We use Jezebel to mean a sexually immoral woman. Ironically, um, there is no talk of sexual immorality around Jezebel in Scripture. She is the wife of Ahab, who is one of the, queen, uh, the kings of the north. What she does is she entices Ahab and the Israelites to worship Baal. But Baal was so associated with sexual immorality within Israel that that's what she became associated with. She was a... Uh, that's, that's how it's, she was a, an unfaithful woman. She was unfaithful to God. She enticed them to worship the Baals. And if you look, um, and we'll talk about this, I keep kind of referencing the, the prophets. The prophets are so tied to the law that every time they say, hey, Israel, you're not doing what you're supposed to do, all they're doing is saying, look at what the law says, you're not doing it. You're following after these things, and look what you look like because of it. So what is the role of the law then? It's important to understand that the role of the law in Israel is an, uh, in Israel as an example of God's own character. Okay, so the law for Israel acted as an example of what God's own character was like. We also understand the need for a new covenant to be accompanied by the gift of the Holy Spirit. So as we read the law, we say, well, what is the role of the law for, for us? One of the things we understand is like, okay, it was displaying to Israel who God is, but it also would show constantly, you guys can't keep these laws. You cannot do this. You constantly fail, not because there's something broken in the law, but because there's something broken in you. And it's not just that you struggle to keep it, it is that you have no desire to keep it. And therefore, there is a need for a new covenant. And if you, and we've talked about this in church um, in Sunday morning a little bit, you know, in the prophets and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, you hear God saying, I'm going to you know, give you a new covenant. And the distinction will be, I will keep both ends of this covenant by giving you my spirit to dwell within you. I will dwell within you and I'll take care of the obedience aspect that this covenant needs. Why? Because you can't and won't do this. If you don't know this, in the New Testament, this is a, a, a little bit of a subtle thing, but in the New Testament, in the Gospels, 
Jesus, when teaching on, um, when Jesus talks about you cannot put new wine in an old wineskin, he's actually talking about this very concept. He's saying, listen, you need to be made new. You need this renewal from me so that I might fill you with myself, my spirit. Why? So that you can be a blessing and be fruitful. But without that renewal, it's going to be back to the same thing. In fact, he says the wineskin will burst. It's the image of an, un, uh, of an inability by anyone to actually do as God commands without God changing who they are at the core. And the whole purpose of all this, the whole purpose of the new covenant and the gift of the Spirit is so that God's people could bear his likeness, so that we could look like God. We could, we could be as image bearers to the world. That is being conformed to the image, image of his son as it talks about in Romans 8, 29. All right. Again, the law was not a means of salvation. I'm going to keep saying this because it's important that we remember this. But rather it functioned... In a, in a couple different ways. And just a very clear statement of the fact that it wasn't a means of salvation. How, uh, how does the Ten Commandments start, the prologue to the law? It starts out by saying, the preamble and the prologue say, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, or the house of slavery, out of the land of Egypt. You shall have no other gods before me. He's saying, I've already saved you. The salvation has happened. Now, because you have that standing with me, this is how you ought to act. They had that, that we would call it maybe temporal or earthly salvation in the Old Testament. So if it was not a means of salvation, it functioned in different ways. First, it set parameters of relationships. And I pointed this out before. The law was not given until there was a community of two million plus Jews that had to figure out how to look godly with one another and with their, their neighbors. It also established, was used to establish loyalty between God and his people. Um, we talked about this a little bit before, that the, the law, the giving of the Mosaic law, reflects a suzerain covenant. That is a covenant between um, a king and his subjects. In this case, the king is God, the subjects are the Israelites. So how did the king, um, what did the king demand of the subjects? Loyalty. How do you show that loyalty? By being obedient to the law. That was one of the ways that this happened. Thus it stands as a model of what loyalty to God looked like, at least during that time. And in the New Testament, that loyalty doesn't necessarily change, but the parameters kind of look slightly different. We're actually going to talk about that on Sunday a little bit. Now, when we read the Old Testament law, there are two major types of law. The first is called apodictic law. We're very familiar with these. These are laws that begin with something to the effect of do or do not. Or sometimes, if you read the King James, you shall or you shall not. Um, those are apodictic laws. They're generally applicable and tell the Israelites, uh, and tell how the Israelites were supposed to, oh, sorry. I have to read this up here again, my glasses. I've got to get used to this. I keep looking through the bifocal part, and I'm like, why can't I see that? Okay, commands that begin with, with do or do not, which are generally applicable, and tell the Israelites how they were supposed to fulfill their part of the covenant with God. There's a word missing there. I'm just trying to figure out what it is. So basically, this is how you're supposed to fulfill a covenant. Do these things, don't do those things. Um, they're, they're direct commands. They're very direct they are generally applicable, meaning like you can apply them generically in different situations. And they're usually in the second person imperative. Now, you might not know what this means. I'll explain it. Um, when we talk about how language works, an imperative means a command. An indicative means a descriptive sentence. So like, you know, um, he went to get the dog. That's an indicative statement. Get the dog. That's an imperative. Second person means that it's me 
you are being told the, the 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 subject is an imply in English an implied you. Sometimes it says you do this. Sometimes it just says do this. The implied subject is you. Does that make sense? Sure. It's implied. It's not always in English. It's not always spoken. In Hebrew, it is actually the you is part of the the verbal form. Um, and these laws are obviously not meant to be exhaustive. It's, it's not like, well, I did everything that was in the do's and do nots. I'm good. Okay, but you did some things that aren't listed there, but you know are wrong. Well, but it wasn't listed there. No, they're not meant to be exhaustive. They're meant to be more example setting. So you couldn't get away with, and actually we'll talk about this a little bit, by the time of, of Jesus, there, the Pharisees especially were trying to be like, we are going to live by the letter of the law. But Jesus would often point out, yeah, but you're missing the heart of it. You're like, yep, I did that and I didn't do that. And we talked about those parables. Like, I loved my neighbor. Well, who's your neighbor? I defined my neighbor this way, so I, I followed that. Yes, but you're missing the heart of the law because you, you hate those guys. Well, I don't have to worry about them because I didn't define them as my neighbor. You are not following the heart of the law. You might be following the letter of the law, but you're missing the point. Um, an example of this, there's a pun, but, uh, quite a few of them, but uh, uh, one is if you look in Leviticus chapter 19, 9 through 19, it has a whole list of do's and do nots. Not going to read all of those. Um, however, an example of them not being exhaustive. I will read verses 9 and 10. It says, when you reap the harvest of your land, you're like, it doesn't start with do or do not. It comes in a second. It says, do not reap to the very edges of your field and gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner. I am the Lord your God. And you'd say, okay. Um, you know, you see this, in, in, by the way, in effect in the book of Ruth, that when you were, like if you're a farmer, how one of the ways that God provided for the poor was, hey, if you don't own land of your own because you're poor, um, and by the way, if you didn't own land, you were poor by definition because land was wealth. The idea is if you were a farmer, you weren't supposed to, you're supposed to just go through and harvest your field just one pass. Anything you missed, you were to leave for the poor so they could come and pick what was left. But it explicitly says, um, when, you harvest, uh, when you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap from the very edges uh, do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen, okay? So since only field crops and grapes are mentioned, because it talks about going to the edges of your field, does that mean that figs and olives were exempt from sharing with the poor and foreigners? Well, I don't, no, 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 it doesn't say anything about figs, it doesn't say olives, so I don't have to, that I can just make sure I get every single one of them. Well, the answer to that is obviously no. No, it, they're not exempt. It applied to every kind of crop you would have, it was just to act as a paradigm. That is, setting a standard by way of example. They were supposed to do that with every crop. And if you, and if you think about it, if the whole purpose of the law was to say, God saying, hey, I care about the poor. I want you to care about them as well so you look like me. I want your heart to be like my heart. So when you, when you harvest, leave some for them. And somebody coming along say, <clears throat> well, God didn't say anything about uh, olives and figs, so I can get all of them. They don't, the poor don't need that. Does that show that you have a heart like God, or does it show that you're trying to kind of weasel your way out of taking care of people? That's, that's the point. It's a heart issue. These laws are more akin to the Constitution than an exhaustive federal or state law codes. They're, they're kind of they're setting out in, broad sweep, in a broad sweep and outline the characteristics of justice and freedom in the land. They're not every single law about every single thing. Kings were allowed, Israelite kings were allowed to come up with their own laws, but they couldn't contradict the laws that already exist, God's law. They could clarify them. They could say, hey, you know, some of you are saying, you don't have to worry about your figs and olives. So we're saying make sure you leave those too in case you thought you didn't have to. You know, um, they could take taxes 
Well, that's not talked about in the law. It's actually told that kings could take taxes when they come, but it doesn't say how much or how whatever. That would be, that would be state and local laws. That would be, this is more, the, the law is more broad stroke. It's meant to be. They're limited in wording, but comprehensive in their spirit. Okay? Because otherwise, the law, there's already 600 plus laws Imagine if God was like, I've got to lay out every single little detail with you about how everything is going to work, even though this is going to be in, in, in place. By the way, the law was in place for 1,400 years-ish, 12 to 1,400 years. You don't think Israel changed at all in 12 to 1,400 years? Yeah, absolutely it did. That would be like, think about it. The United States is actually a relatively young country. We've only been around for 200 plus years. And if we look at some of the laws that weren't existed 200 years ago, we're like, that's weird. We're not doing that. Why? Because it doesn't make sense anymore. Well, but what if it was general? But if you look, we, our Constitution has stayed the same. We've actually amended the Constitution to clarify things. But at the same time, it hasn't necessarily just changed something. That's why we have a whole system to make sure we don't do that. Because of their broad sweep, it would be impossible to keep the spirit of these laws perfectly. In fact, um, if you read in Romans chapter 8, this is Paul's entire argument. Even someone who tries to keep every letter of the law is going to fail to keep the spirit of it. In fact, by keeping the letter, sometimes you are actually going to destroy the spirit of the law. Um, Jesus gives an example of this when he says um, to the Pharisees, he goes, you tithe a tenth of everything you own, even down to your spices, your mint and your cumin, and yet you neglect justice and righteousness. It's hard to command justice and righteousness. It's hard to, to codify and, le- and, and put that in legal terminology. And Jesus says, listen, you should have done the former. You should have done the tithing. That's fine. That's good. You didn't do anything wrong by doing that, but without neglecting the latter. There was even a custom in Jesus' day um, called Corbin, that you'll read about in, in the Gospels, kind of in passing, um, that Jesus actually decries as, as, as against the very spirit of the law, which was um, the law actually requires that people take care of their, their aging parents. And people would say, I don't actually want to do that, so the money that I should have set aside for that, I'm going to commit as Corbin, which is a special offering saying committed to the Lord. And they would say, well, I gave that money to the temple. Now I don't have to take care of my parents. And Jesus is like, what, what's wrong with you guys? You can't, that's not okay. It's not okay. And like, meanwhile, everyone around would be like, well, good for you, give into the temple like that. Meanwhile, their parents are dying. You know, it's, it was, it's messed up. Thus the reason the Pharisees developed a letter uh, to the letter approach when it came to the law. In fact, they did something called, um, that they referred to as rabbis, um, uh, uh, for, for instance, um, Halil, and uh, I think Halil was the one that actually coined this phrase, who was a rabbi in the first century, um, a contemporary of, of Paul and, and Jesus. Um, he talked about how they had to put a fence around the law. We have to, we have to keep the law perfectly, and sometimes we might, you know, we might not keep it perfectly because we, some of those things aren't defined well enough for us. So honor the Sabbath by keeping it holy. Well, what does that mean? We will put a fence around the law. We will define that for you so that way you make sure you don't accidentally break the Sabbath. And they'd say, you can only walk so many um, steps from, from your home on the Sabbath before it's work. In fact, there's a couple of references in the New Testament. They made a Sabbath day journey. Because that's that meant like, oh, within that distance, and they'd measured it in steps. Like. And then they would get around it by saying, Oh, from I'm only to leave that far from my property. Okay. And they would take a their piece of their, you know, like, oh, here's my walking staff. I'll leave it here on the road because I'm getting to that point where I can't go any further. I'll leave it here. This is part of my property. Now I can go further. So they'd come up with these man-made rules and then they'd break them anyway. But the, the purpose of the rule was, well, we don't want to break the Sabbath. And then Jesus comes along and says, you're missing the point. 
The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. God wants you to rest. Rest. Don't try to get out of it through a technicality. And so the, the Pharisees were like, we want to make sure we're keeping the law, so we're going to keep it to the letter. And meanwhile, Jesus says, you're constantly breaking the spirit of it. You're undermining the spirit of it. Matthew 23, uh, 23 Jesus talks about this. Hermeneutical, uh, uh, quick hermeneutical observation about this. Although not its primary intent, one of the things that the law shows us is how it is impossible to please God by our own means. This is one of those things, um, and, and, and righteousness doesn't come by the law. I make this comment often. We, I don't think as modern Christians we get this. Righteousness can't come by the law. And then we work really hard as American Christians to say, let's pass laws to try to make people act righteously. Have we learned nothing? It doesn't work that way. If God's perfect law couldn't do it, there is no way a human law is going to do it. it instead, the law just shows us that it's impossible to please God by our own means. In fact, Paul says what the law shows us is that we're lawbreakers, that we are rebellious. Uh, Romans 3.20, Therefore no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law we became conscious of our sin. He says, This truth should do a couple things. It should leave us humbled to appreciate how unworthy we are to belong to God. Remember, Israelites' belonging to God was not determined by their obedience to the law. The law begins by saying, you're already mine, but this is how I want you to act so you look like me. Likewise, we belong to God even though we are not wor- we don't, we're not worthy to. But it also should move us to praise and thanksgiving that he provided a way for us to be accepted in his sight apart from humanly fulfilling the Old Testament law. Jesus did that for us. Oops, coming in a different order, that's okay. The second type of law is called a, and I'm going to keep saying this wrong, so I have to slow it down, it's a casuistic law, not a caustic, casuistic law. This is a, a case-by-case laws whose elements are conditional. Okay? So this normally uh, involves third-person descriptions. So when, you're young, uh, when a young man does this, this is how that, that's describing in a third-person way. They're not general, but they're actually very specific in their scope. Though there were broader implications to them, they are much more specific. Like, do not murder is pretty broad. But when you have a, when, uh, when this happens in this situation, if this person does this, then you ought to, the other person ought to do that, that's casuistic law. Um, even these laws could not be exhaustive, but rather act in a parad. Uh, dynamic way. So they're acting as a paradigm. They're still setting precedent. Okay. And by the way, if we question whether they're actually uh, paradigmatic, um, the the earlier type, the apodectic law, do not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. That is a, that's an apodictic law. Paul quotes that and he says, it's not just about ox that God are concerned. There is actually, Paul is saying this is setting an example that a workman's worth his wages. And he's using it as a way of saying, thus a minister of the gospel should be paid for the work they do. Now, if you read that that in its original context, you'd be like, what are you doing, Paul? That has nothing to do with an ox and its grain. Well, it does. It's just, it's a paradigm. He's saying, if it's true of ox, it should certainly be true of, of people. In fact, if you look at the rest of the apodictic laws that are listed around that one, they're all about justice for people. And there's this one in there about ox, which probably means by the time of Paul, we actually have some evidence that that's how it was being understood, generally speaking, anyway. He wasn't doing something weird with it. They were understanding it as a paradigm. Because these are so rooted in ancient Israel's civil, religious, and ethical life, they are limited in their application to Christians. It doesn't mean that they don't have any application, but they're much more limited because we are probably not facing situations where we have tiles coming off the roofs of our homes. 
because we have different kinds of houses where we live. Or parapets on your uh, rooftops and things like that. I mean, there's, it, it was very much set in that culture and that time, and some of that doesn't, uh, doesn't translate. Now, you could possibly translate into other settings, but again, we're not under that law. They are, um, none of these are renewed under the New Covenant. There is no sense that any of these are renewed under the New Covenant. These are set for ancient Israel. Also keep in mind, the law was given to Israel as a people, and by the time you get to the New Testament, the focus isn't on Israel, it's on Israel and the world altogether, everybody. And, and if these are kind of, a lot of these are kind of the civil laws for a nation, you can't really apply that when you're like, well, but these are now the gospels for people from every nation. And it isn't, it wasn't the job of the church to turn around and say, we need to make our laws look like the Old Testament laws now in the culture that we're in when the culture isn't, isn't you know, when in Roman culture that they don't care about Yahweh. Well, that wasn't their goal. Their goal was to say, we need to be obedient to God as God's people in the culture that we're in. Example of this would be Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 12 through 17. If any of your people, Hebrew men or women, sell themselves to you and serve you six years, in the seventh year you must let them go free. And when you release them, do not send them away empty-handed. Supply them liberally from your flock, your threshing floor, and your wine press. By the way, would that also mean, like, what if you have olives? Could it be olives? Yeah, sure, it's whatever you have, it's unexhausted. Give to them as the Lord your God has blessed you. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and the Lord your re God redeemed you. This is why I give you this command today, that if your servant says to you, I do not want to leave you because he loves you and your family and is well off with you, then take an awl and push it through his earlobe into the door, and he will become your servant for life. Do the same for your female servant. Now that is weird, right? The end of that is very odd, and I'll explain the, the symbolism of that in a minute. But what is, there's a couple things going on here. First of all, servanthood, and you could even use the word slavery here, but again, that's a loaded term in our culture that meant something very different then. We have guidelines to this. You were supposed to treat them well. This was an indentured servant. They could, um, this was it, was, it was your kinsman. Like, hey, somebody that's a fellow Israelite, they fall on hard times, they don't have a, they need a job. And they say, you say, ah, you can come and work on my farm for a while. How long? Six years. And after that, I'll, I, you are no longer bound to me. After that, you'd have to, you wouldn't be like, oh, you're, you're mine for life. It didn't work that way. It was for six years, and then in the seventh year, you had to set them free. You had to le give them enough money to start a new life. The idea is they're working themselves out of poverty. You had to give them the ability to do that. And it was so favorable, the system was so favorable that some of them chose to continue their role even after their term was up. They chose to continue as servants, but their role would have shifted, which is actually the symbolism. So what would happen is God says here, if they choose to stay, Bring them to the doorpost of your home and take an awl, A-W-L. You know what that is? Tool that you use for punching leather or working into wood. A sharp, pointy stick. And take the, their earlobe and pop it into, through the, your earlobe, pierce their ear into the doorpost of your house. Why on earth would you do that? Well, when it came out, they would put a earring in And normally it was often a gold earring, and it would show that they were servants who were serving out of love, even though they were not required to anymore. And you would do that at the doorpost of your house because you would say, you are no longer a servant, you are now part of this household. You are a family now. By the way, I, I, I'm not one to get my ear pierced, it's just not my thing. Some people... Guys do it, some women do it, that's fine. There's no problem with that. I always thought if I were to ever get my ear pierced, I'd get a little gold earring with that scripture on it. I am a slave set free who serves out of love. Beautiful image, by the way. But again, 
it shows some things, doesn't it? It shows about God's concern for this person who was in the position where they're like, I don't have a choice, I have to sell myself into slavery. That's like, hey, you were slaves, you know what it was like. Take care of them. They're your brother, they're your sister. The servant wasn't owned by the master. Why? Because they belong to God just like the, ma the master did. They, and when they underwent that, that right, they became considered part of the family. So an example, th that, that particular example, here are some applications of that. It provides important background for the New Testament teaching on redemption. It sure does. We are slaves who have been set free. It gives a clear picture of the Old Testament. Servitude was very different from what most modern people think of as slavery. And it gives perspective on the love of God that we may not otherwise have had. It's a beautiful image that comes from the law. It shows the heart of God. All right, so here's kind of wrapping that up. Um, these legal passages are still God's word for us today, though not as direct commands for us. You've got to keep that in mind. They're not direct commands for us, so we can't ever say, and we shouldn't ever do this anyway, but we, we shouldn't be saying, especially to someone else, hey, you're not fulfilling this thing on Leviticus. Yeah, I'm not required to. <laughs> Unless you're pointing to love my neighbor as myself, which is repeated in the New Testament, I, I'm not required to do those things. I don't, I don't have to worry about wearing fabrics that are, are mixed together or planting two types of crops in my field. I don't have to worry about that stuff. Why? Because we're not on that. I can eat bacon. Right there alone is a reason why we should be, every day I'd be like, thank you, Lord Jesus, for bacon. Because if we were in the Old Testament, if we were under the Old Covenant, bacon would be a no-no. Cheeseburgers in, in Jewish, in, if you're, a, if you're a, a Jew that tries to keep kosher, you don't mix meat and dairy, even though it's a misapplication of the text they take it from. So cheeseburgers are out for a lot of Jews. A bacon cheeseburger is straight out. I mean, so we'll talk a little bit about dietary law in a few minutes here. Um, they're not direct commands for us. They're still God's word. And because of its paradigmic uh, function, the law gives us insight into how, under the new covenant, uh, to seek to do God's will. The new, the new covenant's not different in, in the commands. We actually only have really one co new command in the New Testament. We're going to talk about this on Sunday. Jesus gives one new command in the New Testament. It's love one another as I have loved you. He says if you love God, love your neighbor, you've done everything the law requires. The rest of the commands of the new covenant are simply flushing that out. And even then, we're like, Greet each other with a holy kiss. That's a command in the New Covenant. On Sunday mornings, are we like, get up and kiss one another? Some of you might be like, we should start doing that. All the single guys are like, yep, line up. <laughs> guys get handshakes, ladies get a kiss. No, that was a cultural thing that we don't do. Though in some parts of the world, they still do that. It's completely appropriate if you live in the Middle East or if you live in parts of Europe. But here it would be considered strange. So we don't do that. It would be culturally inappropriate. And it would be against the spirit of the law. Plenty of New Testament examples of this too. All right. So that's the long of the four things we're talking about tonight. The other three topics tonight are relatively short. The last one is only 12 points. Pretty quick. And it's more of a summary. So the next thing we're going to talk about is how the Old Testament... First of all, let me just stop. Do, do we have any questions about what we've covered so far? instead of trying to remember at the end of the night everything that we covered. Questions so far? Well, is nothing we do pleasing to God according to the law, right? Uh, Isaiah says it this way. Um, in that same passage, Isaiah 6, he says... Oh, no, it's not in Isaiah 6. It's in the, in the book of Isaiah. He says, all my righteous deeds are but filthy rags. He's saying, I, can't, I, I don't have righteousness of my own. But that's not, you, 
righteousness and pleasing God are not the same thing. And we have to make that distinction. I mean, obviously, following the law was pleasing to God because it, it reflected God to the world. But it didn't provide salvation. That was something God gave that freely, the same as the New Testament. That's not different. Um, and the issue, I mean, am I kind of covering your question here or am I kind of missing it? Yeah. So we're not achieving right standing. But it's and, and, and all of our righteousness are as filthy rags. Yeah. So so it's the things that we're not doing for with the goal of achieving right standing with God. So it's just a little confusing. Yeah, so yeah, th- so to clarify, because I'm saying this for other people that are listening. So the things that we do, so the, the, it's confusing because, like, the law doesn't make you righteous, and so, like, how is that, is the law pleasing to God? Those are separate things, though, right? If I'm trying to say, even today under the New Covenant, if I'm like, well, I do X, Y, and Z that God um, says in Scripture I'm supposed to do, and, and um, I'm doing this so that God accepts me, I'm out, I'm out, of, I'm out to lunch. God already accepts me. My, my actions will not change that, or my inaction will not change that. It is the work of Christ that makes me righteous and nothing else. Now, if I do those things because I'm like, these things are pleasing to God, my motive is completely different. And, and that would be the, the equivalent, and I think that's where we get hung up. We often read the Old Testament law as you had to do those things to be saved. No, you did those things because you were saved, just like in the New Testament. We make a distinction between the Old Testament and the New Testament that God does not make. We say the Old Testament, that was works. The New Testament, that is grace. No, the Old Testament was grace. The whole thing that the New Testament authors, especially Paul, calls out about about how people are striving for righteousness through the Old Testament wasn't an admonition against the Old Testament. It was against Jews' misunderstanding of it. Jesus does the same thing when he says, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And he says, but I say to you, love your enemy. You know, pray for those who persecute you. He's not saying the Old Testament was wrong. He's saying how you're interpreting the Old Testament is wrong. You're using it wrongly. It's the same thing when we say, if I do X, Y, and Z, then God will love me. Nope, God already loves me. I'm already in a, I'm in a right standing with God. I do X, Y, and Z because of that. I do that because it pleases him. I do it because I want to look like my heavenly father and reflect him to the world. But when we get the motive wrong, which is what Jesus is getting at, the Pharisees, they constantly were, they were like, we're doing all the right things, so we're right before God. And Jesus is like, you're self-righteous. You're saying, I'll stand before God someday and say, here's all the laws I, I followed. And he's like, that didn't get you right standing. That, you, you're, you missed the boat. This isn't what it's about. You've missed it. Not because those things aren't good things, but because that's not what they're for. So that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. The law is not works in the New Testament. The keeping of the law. Now, let me rephrase. Let me clarify. The law in the New Testament is never called a bad thing of its own. It's the way that it was applied by by the by Jews of Jesus and, and Paul's day and and before. I mean, even in the Old Testament era, this was true that they would say, we are righteous because we keep the law. And, and Paul and Jesus would say, and all the New Testament authors would say, no, that was never what the law was for. You are, you are thinking that you're righteous by these works of righteousness, by following the law. You're wrong. No, no, and Paul says that as clear as can be in Romans 8. He says, no one's ever been made righteous by the law. But that wasn't the goal of the law. That wasn't the purpose of the law. You are made righteous by the grace of God. You act righteously by obeying the law. It's, the, it's putting the cart before the horse. And that was always the issue. Your heart's wrong. Let God change your heart, and then you'll see this. And, and we still, this is not an Old Testament struggle. We struggle with this just as much as New Testament believers. 
where we're like, I'm a good, I'm a good Christian because I do X, Y, and Z, and so God accepts me. No, God accepts you, and that should motivate you to do X, Y, and Z. And the Old Testament law works the same exact way. That's the, that wasn't is it, its intent. So that distinction between the Old Covenant was all works and the New Covenant is grace, that is a false dichotomy that does not actually exist in Scripture. What was going on is, it, especially by the New Testament era, but even way before that, because this is human nature, they were like, we'll do these things and God will love us. We'll do these things and God will accept us. And, 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 and Jesus says, no, no. You're supposed to be experts in the law and you're not understanding this at all. If you think of Jesus' interaction with Nicodemus in John chapter 3, he says, don't you understand, in order to be part of God's kingdom, you must be born again. And Nicodemus is like, what now? No, 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 I can't, well, I can't like, crawl back up in my mom. This isn't going to work. He's like, no, you have to be born of the Spirit. You have to, like, you have to be made new by God so he can control you and let you do the things that please him. And Nicodemus is like, I don't, what? I don't understand what you're saying. And, and Jesus is like, and you're a teacher of Israel. You don't get this. It was, it's always been a heart issue. That's not a, there's no distinction in that between the Old and the New Testament. The only real distinction between the Old and the New Testament is God said, I know you can't do this. I know you can't keep up your end of this deal. By the way, your standing with me was never determined by you keeping up your end of the deal. Israel was still God's people even when they were disobedient. But he disciplined them like a father disciplines a son whom he loves. And that's why the things that happened to them happened to them. New Testament, it's no different except for the fact that God says, I know you can't do that. So how about you let me live inside of you? I'm going to change, change you, and then I'm going to live inside of you so that you will, can live in a way that pleases me because it's going to be me doing it in you because you can't do it by yourself. And by the way, not only is it like, okay, now I'm doing these things that please God, that's not even the primary purpose. The primary purpose is because God wants to dwell in our midst. He wants to be with us. And so he's like, now I can be with you, and now you can look like me, which is what I made you for. Literally, from the beginning, we we're created in the, to be image bearers of God. And that means that we're supposed to act and look like him. So, All right, other questions before we move on? Good questions. This is the stuff we struggle with, with the law, right? We either say, we're supposed to keep it all, and we're not. Or we say, oh, well, man, must have sucked to be them. They had to do all that stuff, otherwise they weren't saved. Nope, it didn't mean that either. We, we misunderstand the function of the law with Israel. All right, so the Torah, the law, is a, is a, is a group of, it's a law code. It's a, it's obviously, it's, it's, a, it's a series of, of legal documents or a, you know, a legal code. Here's how you ought to act. Israel was not the first people to have a code of laws. Um, codes have been discovered that predate the Old Testament law. The, the date of the Exodus, uh, the early date is 1440 B.C. I'm sorry, the, sorry. <clears throat> the early date to the Exodus is 1440 B.C., which is strange to us because when I say early, you think that it'd have a smaller number. The late date of the Exodus is 1240 B.C. But remember, B.C.s go backwards, so 1440 is actually before 1240. So... I would say around 12, 1400, somewhere in that range. Um, so that's, you know, that's a long time ago for us, but there were other law codes in existence before that. So we're going to take a, just a quick glance at a couple of other law codes that existed um, before the Torah did and look at how they compare to Torah. Um, so we're going to notice some things when we, when we, compare them. The first thing that we notice is there's definite ethical advancements seen in Torah. In other words, people are treating, expected to treat people differently. Um, by the way, when I say the word Torah, I mean the Old Testament law. Okay, so the first example is the, um, this is from a, um, a document called the Laws of, of, of Eshnunah. It's an Akkadian law code that dates to about 1800 B.C., so it predates Torah by at least about 400 years. Um, and we're going to look at one example of the same 
basic law in three different law codes. So the first one, it says, if a free man has no claim against another free man, but seizes the other free man's servant girl, detains the one seized in his house, and causes her death, he must give two servant girls to the owner of the servant girl as compensation. If he has no claim against him, but seizes the wife or child of an upper class person and causes their death, it is a capital crime. Uh, it should say, the one who did the seizing must die. So, yeah, that's pretty great, right? It says, like, listen, if you don't have a claim, meaning like, hey, you owe me money, I'm taking that servant girl. Okay, take her. But if you don't have a claim, you say, you don't owe me money, but I'm going to just take that servant girl from you. And while I have her, I don't know what I'm doing with her, doesn't clarify, but she dies in my possession, i got to pay you back two servant girls. Oh, but if I take, by the way, if I take a, um, if, I, if I grab the wife or a child of a noble person, and they happen to die, well, then I can be killed for that. Well, it would depend. I mean, this is an Akkadian code. They would have had a they would have a tier structure in their society of what causes what would count as upper class. Yeah, they would have their own, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, whatever you want to call that, their own. Uh, it wouldn't be just master slave. No, it would be like your noble. Your um, what's the uh, what, what do they have? Um, I'm trying to remember what the term is in um, in Indian culture. Um, caste. They have a caste system that was very common. So it's like, where were you? Like, what family were you born into? Oh, you're, you're this echelon. Okay, you might be able to work your way up in your lifetime to this echelon, but then, you know, maybe your kids will be better off. But it was a whole system they had. Um, well, they, yeah, they would have understood this. Like, Akkadian, people would have read this and been like, I know what they mean by upper class. They probably, there's probably a word in Akkadian that meant something very specific there, too. This is obviously a translation. Because I didn't bring the Akkadian. I don't read Akkadian, sorry. Uh, this other one is from the law code of Hammurabi. This is actually a very, very, very famous law code, uh, taught, even taught in schools if you like those say, oh, this is one of the earliest law codes in existence. This was written by a Babylonian king that dates to about 1726 BC. We have it very kind of weaned down to almost exactly where. It says, again, same topic, if a free nobleman hit another free nobleman's daughter, uh, and caused her to have a miscarriage, he must pay 10 shekels of silver for her fetus. If that woman dies, they must put his daughter to death. Now, just to clarify, so like one nobleman, free nobleman, hits another free nobleman's daughter. Why would you do that? But if you were to do that, and she has a miscarriage, you have to pay for the baby. If she dies, your daughter will be put to death. Not the guy who killed her, but the guy's daughter who killed her. The guy who killed her's daughter. So he's not, he's not having to deal with direct consequences. Oh no, my daughter's being put to death because I hit this pregnant woman. Very odd. Um, if by a violent blow he caused a commoner's daughter to have a miscarriage, he must, it should say pay, sorry there's some typos on this, he must pay five shekels of silver. If that woman dies he must pay half a mina of silver. If he hit a free, man, a free nobleman's female servant and caused her to have a miscarriage, he must pay two shekels of silver. If that female servant dies, he must pay half a mina of silver. By the way, this is more advanced than the last law code. It's more clarified, and there's, everybody's getting something out of it if it happens. But you'll notice some things. There's a lot of class distinctions built into both of these laws. And there are only fines for the death of a servant or commoner. Whereas death is the punishment for killing nobility. And you'll also notice a noble person would never die for killing a commoner. Or another, another no, I should rephrase that, a noble man, I'm not even talking about women in this situation, just men, a noble man would not die for killing a commoner of any type. 
a servant of any type. And even under Hammurabi's code, if he were to kill another nobleman's daughter, it would only be his daughter that would pay the price. He would not be put to death. The only way a nobleman could be put to death for killing somebody else is if he killed another nobleman. Sounds great. That was the most advanced law code in human history at the time of its writing. Most developed and advanced. Also notice the gender distinctions too. Nobility was immune from punishment from even killing non-noble males. In all these situations, the noble killer goes free. Even his daughter, either his daughter or his servants pay the price. Pretty messed up. But the reason we say that's messed up is because we have a different example. At the time, this was revolutionary. To think that you would, you would pay because you killed this slave, this peon, who cares? Well, you have to at least compensate the owner for him. They were seen as property. Even the women and the, and the children were seen as property. In these codes, women and servants are treated like property. Yeah, I keep getting ahead of myself. Now let's compare that to the same law. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, if that law existed, it must have been something that was going on that they had to address. Well, actually, if you think about it, if you, like, so it must have been common. It could have been like, oh, this is more wealth for you. In that woman's belly, there's more wealth coming from you. I'll just kill her. Yeah. Yeah, we don't know. Or it was common enough that it had to be addressed in kind of detail. And we're probably like, why are you punching pregnant women? What is going on with you, right? Like, why is this even an issue? Right, right. Now, but, I mean, but let's be clear. You, you, if you watch television shows from 60 years ago, you see pregnant women smoking and drinking, and we're, they're like, what's the big deal? And now we're like, whoa, you can't be doing that. Yeah, I mean, it just, yeah. So things change. Now, compare that to prohibitions against murder in, in the Old Testament, in, in Torah. Prohibitions against murder is absolutely unqualified by gender or social status. If you kill someone, you kill someone. It doesn't matter who the someone is. You shall not murder is the command. Not you shall not murder a nobleman. It's you shall not murder anyone. And it, it's very clear in the rest of Torah as that spelled out, what does that look like? There is no, you'll pay a fine. It's you're put to death. If you kill a pregnant woman and she miscarries, you could be sentenced to death. Now, you had the right as the, the, the family, like the woman that was hit or the, the husband, to say, we don't, it was an accident, they don't have to die. You could totally do that. It wasn't like it was mandatory. That's the whole eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. That's the most you could do. But there was no distinctions made. It wasn't like, well, you killed a, a slave. I mean, they're not even really a person. No, they're a person. They're someone made in God's image. The, the penalty is the same. Whoever strikes a person with a fatal blow shall be put to death. A person. It doesn't matter who they are. Servants also have a different status. If you knock out the tooth of his slave, male or female, he shall let the slave go free because of his tooth. Look at this. This is if a master knocks the tooth out of his slave, he has to set the slave free. And we just talked about what does slavery look like back then, right? This is not like a, this is indentured servant. Like, I hired this guy, maybe, maybe we got in a fight. Maybe, you know, I was swinging a hoe and I smacked him in the face and he lost a tooth. I was required to set him free. I wronged you and this is how I'm going to make it right. And by the way, set him free would still be, here is money so you can go live on your own. I mean, it would be like your, 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 your six years is up. It might have been a weekend. Because they were a human being made in God's image, you had to treat them like that. You shall not give up to his master a slave who has escaped from his master to you. He shall dwell with you in your midst. 
in the place that he shall choose within one of your towns, whether it suit, wherever it suits him, you shall not wrong him. So if you had somebody who was a runaway slave, that they fled their master because their master was treating them poorly, it was your job to protect the slave, not the master. Boy, you want to talk about a distinction there? Look at the history of the southern U.S. during pre, um, leading up to the Civil War. Runaway slave, you could beat them, you could kill them, you just had to pay the master. Old Testament law was you make sure that they're okay. Because if, if their master was treating them well, they wouldn't have ran away because they weren't enslaved because they were forced to be enslaved. They were enslaved because they chose it. It's a completely different setup. They weren't property. They were people. Yeah. It's exactly, it's a contract job. And suddenly, hey, my boss is kind of being a jerk and not holding up his end of the contract. All right. Hey, do you want to live here? They're looking for help. Great. Uh, what if my boss comes looking for him? I'll tell him to take a hike. Like it's, he broke his contract with you, man. It's done. Right. It demoted, yeah, really the onus, there, and if you read in the Old Testament, there is definitely requirements for, for, for slaves. For, for, I hate using that word because it's so loaded in our culture, but for servants to act a certain way, to be obedient to their masters, even in the New Testament. But there is also tons of commands on how masters should treat their servants well to the point that it says and if they don't want to leave adopt them basically welcome into the family and of course by the way if the master is like at the end of that six years and the, slave, the, the servant's like hey I, I really like working for you guys like can I just stay and the masters are you know the master's like yeah you know we've been talking about it um we don't think this is going great. They could have ended it, but it says if you choose to, you can let them stay on, but don't treat them like they're a servant anymore. Treat them like they're family. That's, that's a huge jump in a couple hundred years. It's not because humans have evolved because we just talked about how just a couple hundred years ago from now, 3,000 years after this, we were pretending none of this even mattered. So it wasn't evolution in humans. It was the fact that God said, this is how you treat one another to look like me. Because this is how I treat you. And another thing to notice is everyone pays for their own sin. There's no the daughter is going to die for the sins of the father. Fathers shall not be put to death because of their children, nor shall children be put to death because of their fathers. Each one shall be put to death for their own sin. Very clear. Some people, by the way, point out that God does punish um, children for the sins of their fathers. They say the Ten Commandments say that. That is actually false. In the Ten Commandments, it says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the, house of, uh, uh, the, the, house of, the land of slavery, the house of Egypt. You shall have another gods for, before me. Um, you shall not make for yourself any graven image in heaven above, earth below. And then it says, For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the sins of the father, and some translations don't say the word visit. It says, um, was that? Well, he's, it says, what is, I think that King James says, um, I think it just says, bringing the sins of the Father to the children for three to four generations of those who hate me, but showing love and uh, mercy for a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commands. But the word is actually visit. It doesn't mean they're getting punished for the sins of their parents. It's saying they're affected by the sins of their parents. And boy, if that is not true, like I can look at my own family and say, my family has struggled with this thing and that thing. Well, look at it. It's been three or four generations. Why? Because that's all we've known. And I just had a conversation with my mom, and I've had this conversation with my dad, but I had this conversation with my mom like two and a half weeks ago. I said, you know, if it wasn't for the fact that I came to know Jesus, I would have followed that pattern. But that's a great example of God saying, you love me and you want to do what I tell you to do, so you are doing things different than me. Because you can. They can only do what they know. Very biblical principle. All right, so for this section, God's law for Israel was calling them to a higher standard than their neighbors. That's the point. They were just to be a shining light on a hill. When Jesus said that in the New Testament, that wasn't a foreign concept. 
because they were to re better reflect him to the world. That's what the purpose of the law is. All right. You guys ready? Third page. We're booking along here. Reflect. Better reflect him to the world. Yep. All right. Benefits of the law. So our third sheet here. So the perp, remember, the, perp, uh, the, the law could not provide a couple of things. It could not provide eternal life. There's nothing in Scripture that says, do these things and you'll live forever. It could not provide true righteousness. Remember, no one is kept righteous by obeying the law. Remember, righteousness, right standing with God, it could not provide that. But it was not designed to do those things. That's not what the, de that's not what the law was designed to do. When its purpose is properly understood, it became, becomes clear that, that the law was a benefit to Israel. Having the law was good for Israel. So we're going to talk about some of these laws that are a little bit harder for us to comprehend, but from the perspective of how they benefited Israel. The first is the dietary law. So exa an example, the pig, because it's parts, uh, it parts the hoof and is cloven-footed, does not chew the cud, is unclean to you. So pigs are unclean animals in the law. No bacon, no ham, tough stuff. But these are not arbitrary laws. God didn't just say, I didn't like pigs. I kind of feel like I messed up when I made them. No, that's not what it's about. They were protective. These laws are protective in their nature. The dietary law is overwhelmingly protective in their, its nature. Some of those protections no longer need to be, in, um, no longer apply. Um, and some of them were very localized in their protection. So the vast majority of foods prohibited are, fall under a couple of categories. Um, they are more likely to carry disease in the arid climate of the Sinai Desert and or the land of Canaan. Um, now, there is a lot of people that say, yep, pigs are more apt to carry disease. That's not true. Pigs are not more apt to carry disease than, than say, um, cows are, but in an arid climate in that region of the world, that is definitely the case. They are much more apt to um, for a variety of reasons, and there's other animals as well that would be. Um, they're also foolishly uneconomical to raise as food in the particular agrarian context of Sinai or Cana. In other words, God's like, don't, don't, don't do that. That's like you're wasting your money. Like, that's just, that's foolish. So some, some of the, the, the food, and not just food that, when we say food, I don't just mean animals. Remember, there's also dietary restrictions or even um, practices that you are supposed to avoid, like mixing things in a field. We'll talk about that as there's actually a, a, a sympathetic magic element to that. But even then, it's like, that doesn't make any sense economically. It makes it harder to plant seeds. It makes it harder to to harvest your, pro your produce. But ironically, God does say, I want you to rotate your crops, which is something that we found like, oh yeah, that's really, really, really effective, right? Like we see that now. You drive down you know, the road here and you'll be like, oh, everybody here raises soy or, or corn. And you can tell people rotate their crops. Soy, 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 you know, corn, corn, corn. Oh, that's a soy field. Uh, it wasn't last year. Look at all the corn sprouting up in the middle of it because there's leftover seed from the year before and some of it prop. Well, that's actually talked about in the Old Testament that God's like, yeah, rotate them. Don't mix them. Can you imagine trying to harvest corn and soy out of the same field? It would be, you'd be stepping all over the soy to get the corn and it would be, you'd be cutting yourself up on the corn trying to get the soy. It'd be, it's foolish. It just, it, it's not, doesn't make any sense. That is not the only reason that God said that, but it is one. Um, there are also foods uh, favored for religious sacrifice by groups whose practices the Israelites were not to copy. Pigs fall heavily in this category. Now, here's the irony. I said that pigs have a little bit more of uh, an aptitude to, to carry disease in arid climates. That is somewhat true, though actually the more that we look, the less we find that's the case. Um, if, you, if you cook pork, you're not more apt to get sick from pork than you are any other animal. Um, 
you know, we're like, oh, pigs eat anything you give them. That actually makes them extremely economical to raise. You just give them your leftovers. So you're like, well, they don't seem to fall in that category. However, pigs were the go-to sacrificial animal by most other religious groups. I uh, mentioned this uh, in a little history survey earlier that how every time somebody went into the temple to sacrifice, they sacrificed a pig. It wasn't just to slight the Jews. It was because that's what they normally sacrificed. It was extremely common to sacrifice pigs. Why? Probably because they were cheap. Yeah, they're easy to raise. They're cheap. I don't know, but that's, it was very common in most cultures to sacrifice pigs. And God's like, I don't want you guys dealing with those. Leave them alone. So a lot of the things have to do, a lot of the dietary law actually has to do with don't do this because your pagan neighbors do this and I don't want you falling into those traps. There's a lot of ones that are like that. Likewise, the food laws likely kept Israel away from certain allergies, though this is not explicitly stated. But here is a very a great example of this. Being allergic to pigs isn't real common, but you know one of the, the most common food allergies in the world is? Besides peanuts, which is actually a weird new thing, because people have not historically always been allergic to peanuts, and that's kind of a new thing. We won't even get into the whole gluten thing. There's a reason why that's happening too. But um, uh, shellfish. My, both my mom, uh, my, both my mother-in-law and my wife are allergic to shellfish to di varying degrees. I love, like, like shrimp, shellfish, right? I love shrimp. But I'll even notice if I eat, you know, if I eat quite a few shrimp, I'll be like, <clears throat> I'm a little phlegmy because they have more histamines in them that most people actually will have low-level allergy, allergic reaction to. So God said, don't eat shellfish. Not to mention, it's extremely uneconomical to try to get shellfish in an arid climate. Well, I mean, I suppose if you're on the coast, you could try to get some, get some, but it's like, what a waste of time and energy to get this. Like, go just raise some crops or like raise some livestock that will sustain you. Not to mention, a lot of people are allergic to it. This is an odd fact that has nothing to do with what we're talking about, but did you know that Europeans used to be allergic to tomatoes. Did you guys know that? Yeah. Tomatoes are a very common allergy for people to have too, that people are allergic to tomatoes. Europeans used to be allergic to tomatoes. Native Americans, both in Central, North, Central and South America, traditionally are not. But tomatoes were native to the Western world and almost unknown in the Eastern world. And when they were brought back, um, like a lot of Native Americans were like, oh, we don't really eat those very often, but we do eat them. And yet they built, eventually we built up immunities, and now we can eat tomatoes without a problem. But it's kind of a bizarre little factoid for you. All right. Also, potatoes are native to North Amer the Americas and not to Europe. We had to bring potatoes to Ireland. They had never seen potatoes, but they grew so well there, that's why they took it off. All right. Uh, so this is a lot about, sh uh, about the shedding of blood. Here's an example of, of uh, kind of a, uh, how do we look at these. When you shall bring the bull before the tent of meeting, Aaron and his sons shall lay their hands on the head of the bull. Then you shall kill the bull before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting and shall take part of the blood of the bull and put it on the horns of the altar with your fingers. The rest of the blood you shall pour out at the base of the altar. Laws like this set an important standard for Israel. They, all of the dietary, or not the dietary, the sacrificial laws were constantly reminders that their sin deserved punishment. Blood needed to be shed. God revealed to his people through the law that the one who sins against God deserves to death. It, should, it deserves to die or deserves death. It's somehow to death. But God also provided a procedure by which sinners the sinner might escape death by having something else die in his place. This is a substitute's blood could be, could be shed. And actually, these sacrifices were necessary for Israel be, to be able to approach God and worship because otherwise their sin would still be upon them 
and to enter the presence of a holy God with sin on you could result in your death. That's what Isaiah says when he has this vision of God. And, and because of that, they had to, every time they were going to come, now when I said people might sacrifice weekly or every so often, they would, they would sacrifice every time they came to the temple to worship God because those sacrifices had to do with their ability to worship. So if you lived near the temple and you went to the temple every Sabbath, you would come and sacrifice so you could go to worship. Otherwise, you couldn't go. You were not, you're not permitted to go. Like, and you might say, I'm fine, I don't need to, and you would just go in anyway, but they would be like, we know better. That's why the whole issue with Jesus and the money changers is such a big scene in the New Testament. Everybody was expected to, to sacrifice because the understanding is you all sinned. And you had to not only have a sacrifice, but it had to be the right kind of sacrifice and it had to be pure and unblemished. And by the time of, of Jesus, a practice had come into place where people would say, uh, hey, you poor people, that, that, that goat you brought or that sheep you brought, that's not good enough. You got to use one of ours. And they'd be like, well, how much is yours? Uh, well, your, your, your sheep's worth a, a denarii. Ours are worth one and a half denarii. So they're making a profit off it. They were making a profit off people being able to worship God. And who would be kept from worshiping God then? The poor and foreigners who could not, wouldn't have livestock with them. And G, that's why Jesus gets mad. You're like, you're turning this place that's supposed to be a house of prayer into a marketplace to make a profit in keeping people, especially the poor and the foreigners, from being able to worship God. And that's why he gets so angry. He wasn't a, upset about like, oh, look at what you've done. My father is so upset because you've messed up his house. No, it was because you're not allowing God pe God's people to come and worship him because they can't deal with their sin. They also are the backdrop for the New Testament. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. They set the precedent for Christ's substitutionary atonement, that Jesus died, he shed his blood for us. That is, every time you read an Old Testament law that says, you shall sacrifice this animal for your sin, it is just foreshadowing what Jesus did for us. Substitutionary meaning took our place, atonement means died for us. Okay, what do we do with unusual laws? You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. Deuteronomy 14, 21. What do we do with a law like that? Like, uh, what does that have to do with anything? Why would God care about that? Well, these laws were designed to forbid the Israelites from engaging in the fertility cult practices of the Canaanites. So what is milk? What is milk? It's nourishment for what? Well, we drink milk as adults, which is a strange thing, and actually we're the only animals that... No animal drinks milk after they're a baby. No mammal drinks milk once they're, you know, weaned. They stop drinking milk. They eat solid food and they leave milk behind, as Paul talks about. We drink milk because we drink milk. Because we're like, hey, it's nourishing, it's great, and we, we keep getting milk, which is great. But what is milk's primary function? Why do goats produce milk? To feed their babies. And now you took the thing that was meant to help provide life and nourishment, and you used it to kill it. It is a form, and they would think that it was a form of magic by doing that. We think of magic as, oh, they're casting a spell. They thought that by doing certain rituals, they would say, oh, by undoing this life in this kind of grotesque way, maybe we'll infuse the land with magic and we'll get a good crop this year. Or maybe that goat next time around will you know, give even stronger or better or more calves. Yeah, it was something like added. Yeah, well, and, but keep in mind, this was Canaanites did these things to try to appease their fickle gods. Right? 
Well, we didn't get a good crop. We must have angered the gods. Let's do something. Oh, they tell us to boil a calf in its mother's milk. What kind of cruel joke is that? And God's like, don't do that. My people don't do that kind of thing. I don't demand that of you. That's gonna, that's, that looks like your neighbors. Don't do that kind of thing. Yeah, don't go there. I will never ask you to sacrifice your young to me. Another thing that God says, I will never say, take your daughters and your sons and sacrifice them to me. The Baals did that. In a bit, yeah, like the, the Baals and the, the false worship, well, designed to, to, to offend God. And in a sense, probably it was, if you think of it, of the demonic nature of, of that false worship, absolutely. But God is saying, don't do this. My people don't do these things. And yeah, he had to tell them, and we think it's strange, but it was because they saw it being practiced around them. And that's why he had to say, you see those things, you don't do those things. Most of the unusual laws of the Old Testament were so steeped in culture that that's why. So another example of this is the whole thing that is often mistranslated as tattoo. Do not tattoo your body. That was a translational choice. It just says, do not mark your body. And it's a reference not to getting a tattoo, like the way we would do tattoos today. It's like, oh, I got a little ink on my arm, whatever. There is actually no prohibition in the Old Testament about that. And by the way, if there was, we're not under that law, so it's fine. So Christians can get tattoos. You heard it here. Um, But it's actually not a reference to that. It is a reference to a practice that Baal worshipers would do to to say to their God, We are very sincere in in our devotion to you, so we will cut ourselves again and again and bleed to show you how much we really are devoted to you. We see this in the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal. And Elijah's sitting back going like, you're trying to get your God to do and you're cutting yourself and like, yep, keep going, keep doing it. And God's like, I I don't work that way. You're not going to twist my arm to get me to do, don't do those things, I don't respond to that. Why did he have to say that? Because their neighbors were doing that very thing. And he said, you don't, no, you guys don't do that. Now you might say, well, we see our neighbors putting on tattoos. They're not putting on tattoos because they're like, if I put on this tattoo of a skull on my arm and now, you know, now death won't find me. That's not why people get tattoos. That's not what I mean. If you do, don't do it for that reason, but that's not what it's about. So a lot of these had to do with the idea of something called sympathetic magic. This was a very commonly held belief, not only in the ancient Near East, this still kind of permeates our culture in ways that we don't even understand. But like sympathetic magic is the idea that symbolic actions can influence um, the gods, I should say the gods, and nature. Right? You know, weird things that we do, like, and we, like, probably, maybe nobody in this room does any of these things, but, like, that you'll see people do where, like, uh, you know, the old thing where, like, oh, I spilled salt and I threw it a little over my shoulder. Why, I don't want to get bad luck. That's sympathetic magic. That's all that is. You know, oh, it's good luck. That's anything that's luck is sympathetic magic. You're trying to twist fate. That's what you're trying to do. But they had a very structured understanding of how that worked. So if, you we, if maybe you plant different crops in the same field at the same time, you're, you're taking this God and this God, and it's like they're getting married, and now you'll have the, the, the earth and the, and the sun will be coming together, and then they will give you a better crop. So we'll do that. And God's like, no, put the same crop in the same field. Just trust me, it's better for you. But also because they're doing that to try to manipulate nature, and it doesn't work like that. So he's trying to say, don't get involved in these practices. Boiling a kid in its mother's milk was thought to guarantee the fertility of the flock. I sacrificed this one by doing this weird ritual. Now the rest will be healthy. I mean, in our, in our modern minds, it makes no sense, but in that setting, they're like, that makes perfect sense. And if you go to parts of the world, they'd still probably be like, oh, that's a good idea. We should do that, right? But God was like, I don't want you guys to be engaged in that kind of behavior. Because it is, if, if nothing else, it is a plea by God to say, I am not going to be manipulated by your things. You'll have a good crop because I want to bless you. And if you don't have a good crop, it's not because I'm necessarily angry with you, though maybe, maybe it's because of your sin. 
But by the way, your sacrifices or your sympathetic magic isn't going to change that. What's going to change that is repentance, a change of heart. And even then, it might be like, well, there's a reason. There's a, you know, it might, have, it might be something else that has nothing to do with us. And God's saying, I'm not manipulated. Knowing the intention of such laws can help you see that they are not arbitrary, but actually crucial. All right. Laws giving blessings to those that keep them. All right. <clears throat> um, this is in the middle of Deuteronomy. It says, at the end of every three years, you shall bring out all the tithe of your produce in the same year and lay it up within your towns. And the Levite, because he has no portion or inheritance with you, and the sojourner, the fatherless and the widow who are within your towns, shall come and eat and be filled and the Lord your God may, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands that you do. So if you want to talk about what is God's answer to sympathetic magic, it's, hey, you know how I'm taking care of you? Take care of the people around you that can't. All of Israel's laws were designed to be a means of blessing for the people of God. Some of them, however, specifically mention that obedience will provide a blessing. If the people do not care for the needy among them, those without land, orphans, widows, foreigners, Levites, Levites didn't have land, then God would withhold prosperity. But if you think about it, what God is saying is like, listen, if you take from the blessing that I've given you for those who can have land and can raise crops and take care of those who can't, I'll continue to do this for you. But if you refuse to do it, then I will withhold from you just like you are withholding from them. That's not unfair. That's actually extremely just of God. He's saying, I will treat them the way you, the way that you treat them. I want to pour out blessing on you. So make sure they're okay. Give them, bless them, and I'll bless you. By the way, that's not just an Old Testament thing. That's repeated in the New Testament. The tithe that refers to belong to God. See, the tithe they were bringing, it wasn't God saying, I want you to take a tenth of, of all your stuff. Uh, God's saying, on the, every three years, instead of giving it to the temple or giving it to me in some other way, I want you to do it in this way. It wasn't saying an extra 10%. He goes, this is how I want you to give. They're always supposed to tithe. But this year, he says, I want to make sure that you do this. And if you notice, it's this public feast which also means that the wealthy and the poor and the foreigner and the fatherless and the widow would all eat together. It was a community-building event. And guess what happens when you start eating with somebody? That foreigner that you're like, that weird guy that moved in down the street, I don't know about him, suddenly you eat a meal with him, you're like, hey, he's a pretty nice guy. Hey, you know what? Let's bring him some food next week. Let's go talk with him. It builds community. That was, that was part of the intent. It was only required once every three years to have that kind of tithe feast. But you were constantly supposed to be tithing, but normally it siphoned through like, like you were supposed to give to the needy as you saw them have need. Every three years, it was more of a like, this is a little bit more public and, and, and focused. Tithing to the temple happened every year, but guess what? If Israel all tithed to the temple, the temple would have so much money they wouldn't know what to do with it. But what happened is all the stuff that went to the temple got filtered down to the Levites so they could live. And to anyone who was poor and needy, it was a need. But guess what? The temple couldn't distribute it to all the poor and needy around them so that you were expected to do that around you. Every three years, God said, instead of giving the tithe to the temple, give it to your neighbors very directly. that God would withhold prosperity if they didn't do this thing? Yeah, well, God said that. He goes, I'm not going to bless you if you don't do this. Yeah, God, ex Scripture explicitly says, I will not bless you if you do not do this. But if you do these things, you will be blessed. And remember, in Scripture, the idea of blessing is God putting his hand of favor on you, and to be cursed, or the opposite, is God just removing his hand. He's like, if you're not going to do this, then don't expect me to give to you. I'm going to remove that hand. This law, by the way, notice, this law is neither punitive nor restrictive. 
It is a means of benefit both for the needy and for those who benefit the needy. Now, God doesn't say that he's going to strike the land with drought if they don't do it, or they're, he's like, you're not, he's just saying, listen, that blessing, that extra that you just were able to give away, you might not have that. But apparently, according to you, you don't need it because you don't need to give it away. Instead, God's like, if you do this, you will be blessed when you do this. Why wouldn't you do that? It's not restrictive. It's not saying that, like, there's a limit, uh, 10%. Well, can I give 20%? You can give 100% if you want, man. It just, it's kind of more of like, here's a kind of a baseline. All right. If you're okay with it, so we can keep on our schedule here. I know we're going a little long here. We're about five minutes over right now. I would like to, us to go through these last 12 things, but they're literally 12 points. We're not going to comment on them, and they are literally just a review of the hermeneutical approach to the law. How do we apply the law to us? It's literally a review. It shouldn't take more than a couple of minutes, okay? So this is our last sheet. So, um, in the spirit of ap- apodectic laws, I wrote these as apodectic laws. So, they're all do's or do nots. <laughs> so, do see the Old Testament laws, God's fully inspired word for you. So, that's something we should do. It is God's fully inspired word for us. We've talked about that. Just realize what it is and what it's not. Don't see the Old Testament law as God's direct commands to you. By the way, when we get to the end of the 12, you might be like, why don't we just say this up front and skip the rest of this? Because you've got you to you flush it out why this is the case. Uh, three, do see the Old Testament law as the basis for the Old Covenant. That's what it is. The Old Testament law is the basis for the Old Covenant. It is the people's responsibility for, in it. Uh, and therefore, it is also part of Israel's history that we have to understand. Like I said, the prophets make no sense without the law. Don't see the Old Testament as binding for Christians under the New Covenant except where specifically renewed, and Old Testament law specifically renewed. So if the New Testament repeats one of the commandments, then yeah, it still applies. But if it doesn't, it doesn't apply. Like I said, Paul refers to some of the the law that we would say, well, don't muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. And you're like, well, that's part of the law. Does that still apply? He's saying, well, yeah, the principle does. It's the principle of taking care of people. That's a New Testament principle, too. He's just using that as an example. Uh, five, don't see God's, ju- uh, do see, sorry, do see God's justice, love, and high standards revealed in the Old Testament law. That's their purpose, to show God's love, justice, love, and high standards. Uh, don't forget to see that God's mercy is made equal to the severity of the standards. God wants to show mercy. That is overwhelmingly shown in the law. So when somebody, I, I mean, if you think about like even when somebody kills somebody, their, the motive for the killing is actually a part of what's going on. So if it's like, hey, somebody died, but it was accidental, there was ways to deal with that that wasn't that person getting put to death. Example given um, is if uh, the, the tiles of your roof fall off and cause somebody to die, you're told, flee to a city of refuge. And then anyone who, from the family who would come and be like, I want to avenge you because they died on your property, they can't. They got to stay outside the gates of the city. And eventually the idea is cooler heads would prevail and be like, it was an accident, let them go. It was, he didn't mean to do it. Now, if they were to look into it and they're like, that wasn't an accident, they're like, oh, that was, that's murder. We have a different way of dealing with that. Uh, do see the Old Testament law as a paradigm, providing examples for the full range of expected behavior. So as examples, it's not every single thing. Don't see the Old Testament law as complete. In other words, it doesn't have every single thing laid out completely. It's not meant to. It's, it is not technically comprehensive. That's what we mean by that. Do remember that the essence of the Old Testament law is repeated in the prophets and renewed in the New Covenant. We're going to talk about this a little bit on Sunday. That is the Ten Commandments and the Two Laws of Love. And actually, I would argue that the Ten Commandments aren't even necessarily all renewed in the, in the New Covenant in the same exact way, because... They're not even all listed in the New New Testament. 
Um, idolatry isn't listed in, in the Gospels anywhere. I mean, but obviously you're not supposed to make idols. But Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. If you've done this, you've fulfilled the entire law. It says all the law and the prophets hang on those two things. That's the thing that the New Testament... So the apodectic law of don't do this, you shall not, you shall not, you shall not. The New Testament says love. Love like God loves, and you've done it all. You're good. Well, how does God love? Well, that gets flushed out then. So... Don't expect the Old Testament law to be cited frequently by the, uh, by the prophets or the New Testament. The prophets in the New Testament don't cite individual laws very frequently. They do refer to the law in a general sense, like you've broken God's law, you have not kept the covenant, is often talked about. Um, but it's, it's not always like a direct quote of part of the law. It's much more like, you've been unfaithful. Oh, Oh, that makes me think of the laws of unfaithfulness. You know, uh, there's some people that think what Jesus was writing in the sand with the woman caught in adultery, he might have been writing out that law. We have no reason to necessarily believe that. We would have probably been told that if that was the case. But Legal citation was first introduced only in the Roman era, long after the Old Testament was complete. This is just kind of a side note, but important to know. The idea of saying, like we would do this today, we would say, hey, um, you know, can't take my guns away. Second Amendment says, and we quote the Second Amendment, right? That's, that's really new in the history of the world. Oh, really new. I mean, that, that's 2,000-ish years old. The Romans started doing that. Before that, people would just say, hey, you know you're not supposed to do that, right? Right. Well, you know, it says that in the law. That would just be generic. You know, like somewhere in there. Um. Do see the Old Testament law as a generous gift to Israel, because that's what it is. It brings blessings when obeyed. And then the last one, don't see the Old Testament law as a grouping of arbitrary, annoying regulations limiting people's freedom. It was not. It was God's care for his people. Oops. It was a way of God showing his concern for his people and for, for others, even foreigners. Like, this is how you should interact with people that aren't part of Israel. You're supposed to treat them well. You're not supposed to be jerks to them because you're trying to convince them that they should follow Yahweh like you do. So, all right, that's, I told you that one wouldn't, wouldn't take long. Uh, that's all the material on the law. Um, we're going to jump ahead next time, but real quick, um, we're going to pray and then we are going to have just a short, if you guys are okay with it, like a three or four minute conversation uh, before we get done tonight to talk about some scheduling stuff. So, Lord Jesus, thank you for this opportunity to come together and to talk about your law and how it shows your heart and concern. And we thank you, Lord, that we aren't righteous by keeping your law, but neither was Israel. We are made right before you because of your grace and mercy and display in Jesus. We obey your word so that we look like you because we love you. But your love came well before our obedience. So Lord, as we reflect on your love on display in your, in your law, help us to see it for what it is. Help us to see you in it. And thank you, Lord, that your spirit living in us is what allows us to be obedient to your word and helps us to live out the righteousness that we have because of Jesus. We ask all this in Jesus' holy and precious name.